This is a production of Cornell University. So this is going to be a little bit different from the more usual 100% research seminar, as you can hear from our affiliations. Uh, so this is a combination of research, especially the first section that I'm presenting, and then extending into a conversation. So we want to invite you all to join a conversation that the three of us have been having for a couple of years about exactly this topic. So along those lines, I'd like to invite you to uh, jump in, get your hand up, interrupt with a question or an, a correction or an observation, or if we're using some jargon that, that you're not sure about. So, so please chime in at, at any time. So for part one, I'm going to cover all these topics, but fairly quickly. So trying to talk about what do we mean by idle lands, and it's a little trickier than you might think. Uh, and then another term is marginal lands. <clears throat> the same applies to that. So the research portion that uh, we did was looking at what land might be available that's not currently in in any type of commercial production. And how much hay and forage could be produced on that. And the, the research part that I'm talking about is assuming a high intensity management on that. So kind of what's the, the technical high end potential for, for production. And that's, I should say, that's not typical for a lot of land in New York. It's not managed at that high intensity. And then some, some very, uh, uh, broad estimates of what could we produce on these lands? How much beef could we produce? How much bioenergy feedstock and bioenergy could we produce? And how much hay and forage could we produce? And then, uh, then Mike and Aaron are going to jump in with some reality checks on this kind of technical potential and say, what are some of the challenges and barriers that are in the way of achieving this technical potential. So here's a nice uh, photo courtesy of Mike. So what are we talking about with idle lands, marginal lands? What's this all about? So typically, if you're driving around New York State, you often see the bottom land, which often is in, it can be in annual crop production. If you can see the hay bales here, there's hay production on some of the sloping land. And then the further up you get, um, this, all this shrubland could be pasture, could be who knows what, could be transitioning slowly back into forest. So what we mean by idle lands for, for, for especially my portion of the talk is, that, as I mentioned, it's not currently in you know, commercial production. But it's really a wide variety of land cover. So it could be more or less kind of look like hay or pasture. It might look more like shrub, scrubland. Um, it's not a forest and it's not annual cropland, but there's a, there's a lot of territory in between there. And it's hard to quantify this because it's something that's not really counted, right? It's the agricultural survey gives us the the, the land that's in production. There's an older separate survey of horses in New York, estimating they use about a million acres of land. Some of that's on farms and much of it is not. But beyond that, we have very little survey data about how the land, this, these lands are being used. So an important thing here is when we say idle, that really should have quotation marks around it because it could be used for hunting. It could be used for some non-commercial use. Um, so we, we can't say that the land isn't being used for anything. We just know it's not in commercial production. OK, marginal lands. I, I love this quote. I'll give you a chance to read it. I think it sums it up very nicely. So the gist of it is, we use this loosely for land that has biophysical problems. Uh, and if you notice, this quote's from 1932, but this kind of sloppy 
thinking and talk about marginality is, is still happening. So I, I think that the real definition is economic. So it's marginal for some type of economic production, meaning there's little or no possibility of a profit. So on good soils, as you increase inputs like fertilizer and labor, you get a pretty big jump in your return in production. On marginal soils, you could put in the same amount of effort and inputs, but you get a much lower plateau of production. And if these are the production costs, on the prime soils, you've got lots of room for profitability. And on the marginal soils, little or none, right? So that's, that's to me what marginal really means. So what, why is it marginal? So this is where we get back to the biophysical part, often wet, stony, perched water tables, et cetera. And you all may have your, your favorite issues of, of, of what kind of limitations occur on some lands in New York. So an important thing I said is, it, so, so some marginal croplands are now wineries. <laughs> so they might be marginal for beef production or for hay production. They might be great for wineries. So it, marginality is an economic term and it's related to what the heck you're producing, right? <laughs> it's not the same for everything. So how did we go about with all those challenges trying to estimate how much idle land there is? So we start with spatial data to look at land cover through the state. And that helps us narrow down and get rid of the forests and get rid of the annual cropland and the developed land. But then we use ag survey data to tell us at the county scale how much land is in commercial production. So our result, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail about methods here, is just under a million hectares or 689,000 hectares of potentially idle, potentially available land. So here's a picture of land cover for all of New York State. Lots of forest, fair amount of wetlands and developed land about 9% in annual cropland, about 9% in grasslands that are in production of some kind. And then this is what we came up with that about 5% of New York State is idle grasslands, about 3% is idle shrub and scrub lands. So meaning what's, what's there now? So these are the, I mentioned the total, but it's not all, all this land may not be suitable, or as I mentioned before, it's not necessarily all really available. Depends what people want to do with their land. So how do we then estimate production potential on these marginal lands? And we use a combination of soil properties and climate, and that's integrated into something called the National Commodity Crop Productivity Index. Uh, so this is just a map showing this index with the low values in red, the high values in green. You don't see much green. The better ag lands in New York are showing up in the mid-range of yellow here. Um, so you can see this in Ohio. There's, there's some patches of green there. So where do we see a lot of these low productivity or, or low soil quality lands? Uh, Adirondacks, Catskills, and then some of the southern tier as well. So this is then the, uh, this available, potentially available idle land shown across this soil quality index. So the index goes from zero to one, so the high values are good. <coughs> So for current hayland, we see most of it's kind of in this mid-range, meaning it's not all that different really from a lot of our annual cropland. The land that's currently in herbaceous cover of some kind, 
again, most of it's in kind of this, this middle range. The shrub and scrubland, um, <coughs> more of it is in this lower productivity range. But the important thing is it's really, all of these are pretty well spread out. So within any of these categories, there are some soils that have some high biophysical soil quality. So that's encouraging if we can find those and use them. So to, to model potential hay and forage production on these lands, uh, we have a, a very simple generic model of productivity potential for, for essentially perennial grasses. Uh, we, have, we created separate ones for warm season grasses, meaning C4, and cool season grasses, meaning C3. So again, this result is a technical potential assuming a high intensity of management. And again, that's not typical, but it's, but it's possible. But then we evaluated these models uh, by, by looking at how do these models do uh, with some data that we did not use to develop the models from forage uh, yield trials throughout New York State. So, uh, sorry, this, this is a photo of a yield trial courtesy of Julie Hansen, who works very hard with the team on, on conducting these trials for many years. So the three lines are models. I'm not going to talk about corn silage today, but just to point out that it's the model and the data are higher for corn silage than for any of these perennials. And for the cool season grasses, uh, there's, there's a range uh, among sites and years. But the, the data from these yield trials seem to suggest that our, our simple models aren't too far wrong, meaning that the, the data are, are falling reasonably close to our, our predictions that were, again, independent of these data. Just a quick note on why are the warm season grasses lower productivity than the cool season grasses? And, and, and this is just a, really a function of the effort that's gone into breeding and managing cool season grasses in the state. So with a great deal of effort and over many years or decades, there's no reason why the warm season grasses couldn't move up further. But this is what we think is feasible uh, today. So an example uh, of a warm season grass is switchgrass. I'm not going to try to read the whole slide, uh, but this was kind of our model grass for thinking about bioenergy production. Uh, for, the, for the forage, um, we were looking more at the cool season grasses. So we also translated, essentially our effort was on uh, what's the forage production potential. And then we just use a simple, very crude calculation to say a certain number of pounds of forage uh, in a beef stocker operation, meaning uh, beef uh, foraging throughout the growing season. Um, you know, how many pounds of forage would translate into a, a pound or a kilogram of, of beef? And we've done a lot of work historically on bioenergy, so we also looked at uh, again, the warm season grasses, turning those into industrial quality pellets and using them for heat. And, and also for ethanol. So these are our results. And this is just a summary for the entire state. So the very small bars are beef because we're looking at total uh, millions of kilograms per year on all of this idle land base. So, so beef production is, is very low in terms of kilograms or in terms of millions of kilograms. Uh, and then the, the highest production potential is the hay. So essentially with the, with the pellets, we're, we're losing some through the process of um, manufacturing them. And they're also being made from the C4 grass, which according to our modeling is a, 
likely to be a little less productive. If we look at these in terms of the value of that product, not profit, but just the value of that production at the wholesale level, um, not too surprisingly, all these bars switch direction, right? So that small amount of beef production has the highest uh, dollar value. And then, uh, actually, all these other options had a, had a similar, roughly similar, sorry, dollar, dollar value. So here are a few challenges and barriers. Um, what are the landowner's goals? Are you in a location where it's feasible to actually use this land? Do you need fencing? Do you need drainage? Do you need barns? Uh, is capital available even if it's a viable business model? Etc. cetera. And uh, Mike and, and Aaron are gonna talk about a little more about some of these and I hope you'll all think and, and chime in if you think of other challenges and barriers and of course opportunities as well. So summarizing for point one, there's, there's quite a bit of land out there that's not in commercial production and some, some fraction of that could be available for increased production. And some fraction of those lands actually have uh, decent biophysical soil properties. So there's a technical potential if, with high intensity management to produce quite a bit on these lands. But of course, there are a lot of challenges and barriers that mean it's not gonna be feasible to achieve all of that technical potential. So I have a few citations that'll come up at the, at the end of the talk. And I, I haven't really, um, it looks like, we could take a few questions right now before we move into the second part, if anyone has anything right now. Peter. Go ahead, Anne. Okay. Peter, I was curious, um, a lot of marginal demands may not be continuous, but in order to have cows or to produce, there is like a certain minimum amount of space. Does your model account for that? Uh, it, a, a little bit. We, we removed um, pieces of land that were uh, that were less than five hectares, I believe. Um, so we were trying to kind of get rid of those small pieces of land that would be hard to to bring into production. Peter, did you look at all into why these lands are not being used now? I mean, we'll see the constraints later on, but I mean, did anyone? No. Or has anyone looked at? Well, why is it idle? No. Okay. Essentially, we have no, we're doing everything by difference, right? We're no, identifying the idle land because it's not something else. So we know almost nothing about it. I mean, it could be because there's not enough labor in them or, the, or there's other aspects. I mean, what are the reasons that no one is using it now would be an interesting question. Yeah, I think, you know, all we can say about that is the slide I showed of sort of a, the histogram of the soil quality, yeah. showing that in fact, quite a large portion of these lands are of reasonable quality. Yeah, they yeah. have reasonable yeah. production potential. Yeah. Exactly. According to this. Yeah, that's, that's what struck me. That's why I yeah. asked the question. Yeah. Thanks. But I mean, uh, so another clue you can look at is landowner surveys. And most, many landowners are not interested in commercial production of any kind. Huh. So that's another quick answer, right? Um, and, and as lands change hands, they tend to be moving out of farmer hands and into other landowner hands. So, so that's another trend that, that there's some data about. Peter, a quick question. Have you come across what, you know, what is the intrinsic value of these lands? I mean, they're marginal, but they could have other, you know, conservation. But those externalities, do they come into play? I mean, I realize it's for production, but this might be an argument that somebody might say. What's wrong with having them go to scrub bird life? You know, more sure. of that kind of biodiversity. Yeah, so I, I think I would, so I, yes, these lands have lots of value for lots of things. Hunting, um, you know, there's some endangered, uh, there's some at least threatened bird species that nest in grasslands. Um, so some, some operate like switchgrass production is compatible with 
spring breeding birds because <laughs> you just harvest in the fall typically. Uh, but, but yes, uh, there are competing current uses that are non-commercial. There are other values to these lands. Um, so that's why sort of the idol is in quotation marks. Uh, yeah, I, I, I want to riff on something that David was saying. And I, I think in a sense you're sort of selling yourself short on the idle land question, because I would perceive that the idle land of today is going to become forested land of tomorrow. And so I'm wondering if, if maybe you should sort of think that some of the forested land of today was in fact the idle land of yesterday. And so I'm wondering if the, the, the acreage that you're looking at maybe actually an underestimate and, and I, I, I uh, Yes, there has been agricultural land that has transitioned back to forest. Um, so, so depending on the location and what's going on and seed sources for the for forest and deer pressure, et cetera, it can take a surprisingly long time, you know, decades or more or, or never to get back to sort of an intact valuable forest. There's a very long period of time, and it may be kind of indefinite, that it can be in this shrub scrub, you know, hawthorn. I'm sure we've all walked through this kind of land, you know. <laughs> um, so I don't know if that answers us at, at, at all. But no, I, I'm just thinking from, a, from a, a, a land potential. Obviously, you'd have to then, in a sense, clear to put it back to idle land. But, you know, it's it, in a potential wise, there, I would think that there'd be a lot more land available that would fit into this model sure other so, than back the definition right so of land. intentionally we did not look at forest land and we did not look at wetlands both of those potentially could be brought into production but our thinking is there's a lot more conflicts with that and it's also a lot more effort and challenge to actually achieve that so that's why we focus yeah. on the lands that are not forest, not wetlands. Great. Well, let's move on to, to, to Mike and, and part two. Good deal. I'll uh, just add a few comments to that. If we think about what this idle land was used for 50 years ago, it was in dairies. So what has changed as these dairies have moved as a dairy structure has changed. Uh, even though that land may be productive, it's as uh, uh, one person mentioned here, they're in smaller acreages, harder to use uh, with uh, larger equipment. And so these dairies have gone to land more suitable to row crop production. So that's, that's a big part, especially in Southern Tier, why there's so much idle land in that area. And the other thing I would argue is that we want open land for aesthetic reasons. Uh, we don't want to look like New Hampshire, at least I don't, uh, where it's all trees. And so uh, I think a very strong argument is, is to keep open land. Can I just chime in there? So New Hampshire, 100 years ago, was 25% forest and 75% clear. So. All right. So when we look at, uh, I like this slide because when we look at whether a business can be profitable or not, it's based on what their local resources are and making the best use of them. So this uh, uh, logger in Maine uh, was uh, smart enough to know that uh, uh, he's well uh, endowed with, with moose uh, in the area, and so he used him to, uh, to move his logs. I've never been able to confirm or deny whether this is Photoshopped or real. <laughs> All right, so, you know, we all know this. We're, we're in the pasture region, right, uh, forage region. Uh, we can grow uh, forages extremely well. We're not in the corn belt region, uh, so growing corn really doesn't fit uh, our environment. Uh, and so consequently, we need to, again, if we're going to have profitable agricultural businesses, we need to focus on what we have lots of, and that's forage. This is a picture. Uh, this is just some data from the southern tier of uh, vacant land that uh, Dr. Ift put together for me. Uh, this is uh, uh, Stabenn County. Uh, there was a, a glitch in the data collection. Uh, Stabenn isn't that, uh, uh, would fit in very well with all the other counties. And that you can see very visually, there's a lot of vacant land uh, in this southern tier area. 
And if she had done the, the uh, uh, northern New York area, and actually even some of that central New York is, is the same way. So what are the resources that we have uh, in, in New York uh, to make beef cattle work? Uh, we've got markets uh, the, uh, and a whole variety of markets uh, in terms of grass finished, uh, organic, uh, GMO free, uh, free range, but we also do have some grain finished markets. Uh, natural is growing uh, quite often, which is often grain finished, uh, but no use of uh, uh, growth promoting hormones. Uh, or antibiotics. Uh, so because of the consumer demand, those are resources that we can take advantage of. And the reason for that is, is uh, consumers. You know, uh, Montana has an advantage where they have lots of cows, but they don't have any consumers. Uh, and so uh, that gives us uh, lots of opportunity uh, to, uh, to diversify our portfolio, if you will, and meet that uh, uh, demand. So, uh, one of the advantages, and I'm going to talk specifically about this stalker that uh, uh, was mentioned. Uh, that's the an it's a youngish animal that's put on grass, grazes for the summer, and then goes into a finishing program, which can be historically grain finished, but also can go into a grass finished system. So it's uh, that short period of time from May to October type. So it's one of the few uh, enterprises, ag enterprises that you can get into with very little capital up front. Uh, if you're going to try to start a dairy, it's nearly impossible unless you marry into it or inherit it. Uh, so uh, uh, that provides a huge advantage. A cost of production is low uh, here in the Northeast. Uh, our calves are cheap, uh, much to the uh, uh, disgruntlement of our cow-calf producers, but there's reasons for that, uh, which we uh, talk about another time. Uh, we've got relatively good production per acre in terms of forage, uh, and that's extremely important for ruminants, those that uh, can take that. We have inexpensive land. Uh, I know a lot of people don't believe that, but I came from West Virginia, and believe it or not, land in West Virginia is more expensive than here in New York. Uh, and, uh, and you go out into the corn states, forget it. Believe it or not, for full-time farmers, we have a relatively favorable tax environment uh, because if you get more than 50% of your gross income from agriculture, your taxes are greatly reduced in terms of school and property taxes. So the, 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 um, the, the disgruntlement with taxes is, is really not entirely true. Uh, with uh, uh, this stalker operation, we don't need much equipment, which is why you can get into it uh, without a lot of money. Uh, you don't need much facilities, obviously. And by doing custom operations, that is, owners of cattle will pay you to graze them, you don't need a lot of capital up front for the animal purchase. So uh, there's real good opportunities for getting in. Uh, labor flexibility is a great thing. Uh, that's the beauty of all beef cattle operations is if you're a dairy operation, you're tied to that dairy twice a day plus. With a beef operation, you've got a lot more opportunity. I was talking to a, at a meeting last night and he was gonna be away for three or four days. He just filled the hay feeders over full and they'd be fine. He had someone check on the cows obviously, but he didn't have to feed them every day. Uh, and, and with a grazing operation, you can do the same. So instead of giving them two acres like you do every day, you know you have a schedule that's going to conflict, maybe you give them four or five acres. Production goes down a little bit, but it's not going to really impact profitability for that short period of time. It can be started as a part-time enterprise. Uh, again, if you're working off the farm, a way to get into the business. And it can be uh, incorporated with other interests such as agroforestry, uh, maple syrup production in the winter, uh, those kinds of things. Uh, you can and should probably utilize purchase feeds for anything you do on most beef operations, and I can argue pretty strongly on that one, uh, even though uh, you see way too much equipment on beef operations. And then for our current skill force, which is dairy, a lot of the skills that they have in producing high quality forage and having facilities and equipment can fit in very nicely with this, uh, especially in the winter time when we're trying to grow these calves until they're ready to go to grass. So uh, 
has a lot of good deal. Uh, we can do it with dairy. We can do it with beef. We can do it with heifers. We can do it with cows. I mean, there are times of the year when you can buy cows cheap enough that you can put weight on them inexpensively on grass and then resell them. So you've got a lot of flexibility. The other thing that's real uh, advantageous to us is the price cycles. If we look at, so the, the top line, which is the blue line, is over the last 20 years, this is the index of 550 pound feeders. You can see in the spring of the year, they're very expensive, or, or that's the highest price. They're lowest in the fall. Well, look what happens with the 750 pounder, uh, which is basically the result of backgrounding or stalkering that calf. It's highest in the fall. So you can buy the calves cheap and put the weight on by using this uh, cycle. And this, this is a pretty strong cycle. It's not true every year. Nothing is true every year, but it's a pretty consistent uh, historically uh, system. This is the grazing uh, potential. And, and uh, unfortunately, I've not been able to find any enterprise data past 2014 and ignore 2014. <laughs> Uh, that was a very odd year, and, and those in the stalker business made a lot of money, but it's not normal. But you can see over the last 10 years or so, it's been about a $70 per head. And when you look at beef enterprises, the stalker operation has more bars above the profit line than below as compared to cow-calf or, or finishing. So the stalker has a lot of opportunities. The biggest challenge is that there's not a good market infrastructure for moving those calves. So we know that the larger the number to sell, the better price we can get, which means that producers need to work together. And any of you that have worked with farmers know getting them to work together is, is a huge challenge. Uh, Aaron and I have spent 30 years trying to do it and we'll retire not getting it done, so for the next generation. But uh, cooperation is, is something that, that really needs to happen. So that's a, and we have a very antiquated, if you will, mark, auction market system. Uh, some states have a very good marketing system. Uh, and, and so there's just a, that market infrastructure probably is our biggest uh, drawback to, to getting this done. But everything else is, is falling in place uh, pretty nicely. And I believe that's it. Any questions? Did I use any terminology? Ken's smiling, so I'm waiting for his. Yes. I have a question about um, processing. Yes. Yep. We and that's a great question. Uh, was had to do with uh, slaughterhouses uh, and the the uh, uh, perceived limited number. Uh, we're just finishing up a, a, another project looking at the barriers to ruminant production in the Northeast. And along with that is a survey of packing plants, uh, mostly in, in New York and New England. Uh, and while there is areas of the state that are, I'm talking about specifically New York, while there are areas of the state that are short on packers, it has more to do with seasonality than it does with supply. Because if you look at a, a small processor, they're really busy from about September to January. And then they're really slow from then on out. Uh, and so packers and producers need to work together, that terrible word again, uh, to try to even that out. Packers need to charge a little less in the summer. Producers need to, to match their production with availability. So, but there are some issues. Yeah. Um, we talk mostly about bee stalkers. Mm -hmm. What about sheep? Sheep could work too, you bet. That's not my background, but uh, sheep certainly, uh, there's some predator challenges and some internal parasite challenges uh, that you don't have with beef cattle, but yes. Now, just, just to comment, in the mid-70s, when I took a look at this with some of my other colleagues, sheep looked very favorable when the market was largely home uh, consumption and filling the freezer. Beef was too big. Yeah. And there's still some of that. And I think for, to have a, 
a large economic impact on, on with beef cattle or, or sheep for that matter. I think the system, the, the system is going to be both uh, direct sales using smaller plants as well as some more commodity type agriculture. Because on, you know, farmers do not like the market. And so to say the only way you can do this is to sell direct to the consumer, we're not going to expand the market. I'm a farmer. I hate marketing. <laughs> on the side, obviously. So now Ken is a great marketer and, and has built up a, a business uh, being able to do that. And, and I can point to a lot of farmers that, that do that very, very well. So, yeah. Is there something like crop insurance for beef production? Because I see a lot of variability year to year, and you had its average, but there were some years I would be suffering. Uh, not for the animal, but there is crop uh, insurance for pasture and hayland. For the actual production of the? Of the feedstock, if you will, but not on the animals, right? There's no, the only subsidy, if you will, again, is based on the, the seed or the feed stock. And I will say, as far as the grass finished market, uh, that we have some organizations now that are putting into place. Because I said farmers don't like to market. They like to produce, but they don't like to market. So I think if we had a good, steady year round market where I could say, okay, I've got 20 grass finished steers and I know they're going to be ready in April, and I don't have to worry about selling them direct. I'll take a little less money, but I'll get a premium over the commodity market. And those are starting to get in place. Uh, and I think as they grow, we'll see more because we're near, near the. So, so there's no co-ops that are forming, such as the grains in central New York? There's nothing like that. <laughs> you know, there's a few around, but they've struggled. So. Mike, is there, is there kind of an opportunity for somebody as a business proposition to try to, you know, rather than getting everyone to co-op, like to come in and and you know, maybe be grass finishing animals over the winter and sell them at a time when the market's there. I mean, in other words, sort of look at these gaps as a business opportunity. Yeah, I think some coordination would work. Uh, I personal opinion, but finishing cattle, whether it be on grain or on grass, is a is a pretty uh, skillful activity, uh, and so I think. The way this will work eventually to be most efficient is that we will have professional grass finishers, uh, and then they will then be much easier to fill in these gaps. So, but the, the the farm with 25 cows and finishing 10 calves a year just is it, it's not going to work. He or she's never going to gain the skills to be really good at it. Yeah, I was wondering if somebody could have an operation just to finish in that. Glad to be here today. I would uh, say one reason to keep land open is because it's an awful lot of work to clear overgrown land because I've done it. <laughs> um, so I'm going to talk about hay production. And uh, again, in my experience, we're talking about hilly, rocky clay soil. Um, if I were dictator of the world, I would force everyone to have a garden on hilly, rocky clay soil so they could appreciate good soil and have a little sympathy for the farmers. So if you were to go to the farm newspaper and buy some hay and look at the classified ads, what kind of hay would you be looking at? Well, how would it be described? First cutting, second cutting, alfalfa, and grass. And I'm trying to get my farmers to expand their imagination of hay and think more about its end use so they can market it for a, a target. So when we're, when we're selling hay, we have local markets and within the country, and we also have markets outside of the country, which we'll talk about a little bit. So of late, uh, addressing the, the horses that are metabolically challenged, they need a low sugar hay. Um, we're grass finishing beef. And sometimes too much protein is not the way to finish beef. We need some high energy hay. 
Uh, some dairy farmers actually buy straw and stick it in their totally mi mixed rations to add a little fiber to the diet. Uh, speaking of sheep, we have bird's foot tree foil that can suppress parasites. Uh, then we have other you know, animals in different stages of growth and production that need specific nutrients. And then um, also we have our young livestock that need something that's palatable to eat. And I have a particular affinity for Kentucky bluegrass ladino hay. I just think, uh, you know, farmers actually call Kentucky bluegrass dog hair because it's a fine grass and they don't like it. And sometimes the bales don't hold together. But nutritionally, it's actually a pretty, pretty, decent, uh, pretty decent forage. So has anyone ever heard of Western hay? Okay, so when farmers think of Western hay, they, even in the East here, they've got an image in their head of what Western hay is. It's nice and green, there's no weeds, and it's usually pure grass or pure alfalfa. So I guess what I wanna propose is why don't we produce something, why don't we brand New York hay? Why don't we think outside the box a little bit and be a little bit more creative? So my affinity for uh, Kentucky bluegrass, the dino hay, I have a little one acre field outside my house that I've been playing around with. And when we look at um, some of the uh, nutrient values of this, it's, it's really quite good. In particular, we're looking at low lignin. So in this column, if I went to Dairy One and went to their library, this is uh, mixed mostly grass hay, and this is the range of, of values. So when we look at like lignin, you know, it's fairly low in lignin. This hay here was sitting outside for five days before I finally bailed it because of weather and machinery. So that's the worst of the lot. Uh, our water soluble carbohydrates are quite high. Okay, at the high end of the range. This is uh, simple sugars, again, at the high end of the range of uh, grass hays. Total digestible nutrients. You know, we're at the high end again, and our in vitro total digestibility, you know, looks pretty good. So I think we just need to get out of our box a little bit and think about forage a little differently. The other thing is we, ha we have a pretty difficult environment. We have a lot of humidity out here, so sometimes it's hard to um, make hay and dry hay. So we might need to add a little technology. And so this is from a machine called a macerator. Uh, I don't remember if I got a picture of it in the next slide or not, but it's basically a roller mill. Your forage goes through two steel rollers spinning at different speeds and you can see how it scratched the wax off this grass leaf. And that, so that helps the hay dry in good conditions up to a day quicker than normally. And then if you have some old reed canary grass, the farmer that sells these was telling me he can take old reed canary grass and run it through his macerator and it softens it up quite a bit to make it more palatable. So uh, hay for, so that's the domestic market. I think, you know, we can expand and be competitive if we, Again, farmers don't like the market, but if we can get them to market and think about the end use of their hay, maybe they can have more loyal customers. So hay for export, um, alfalfa, timothy, oat hay, ryegrass straw, when they produce uh, seed out in Oregon and Washington, they take that straw and send it to Japan for their Waigu beef. Uh, we export grass hay, we export straw. Most of this is going out from the western part of the U.S., uh, we had a um, the National Hay Growers Association meeting here in, in uh, Canandaigua about two years ago, and I, I attended and met a farmer from Pennsylvania that actually exports hay out of the out of Philadelphia. So um, hay exports, of course, of late markets have changed quite a bit. But um, hay exports do have been increasing. Most of them go to Asia, but the Middle East also is, uh, buys a lot of our hay. And in fact, 
uh, Saudi Arabia is buying up land in Arizona so they can produce alfalfa because they have a policy where they don't want to be using their water in Saudi Arabia for growing alfalfa because there's better, better and higher uses for it there. So they're coming to our country to produce their hay. So this is just some of, this is, uh, you know, 2017 information here. But those are some of our hay exports. And I just figure, why can't we get in? Here in New York, we have the Port of Albany, we have uh, Oswego, and we have Buffalo. Uh, why don't we export some things out of our ports? So China was going to build an alfalfa protein extraction plant in Canada. And uh, this is some information I read in 2014. I went back and I don't think they ever came through with it. But as I read it back in 2014, I was thinking, you know, alfalfa is 50% leaves and 50% stems. You know, why are, we, why are we shipping lignin across the ocean? It doesn't make sense. And that's why I love uh, Ladino hay so much is because the way it grows, you're really just harvesting the leaves and the stems or stolones that run along the ground. And uh, if you get a rainy day, a couple rainy days or a rainy week and you can't get to it when you want to, you're not getting the increase in, in neutral detergent fiber or that lignin like you do in alfalfa or grass. So it holds its quality pretty well, even in bad weather. So can we produce, uh, can New York produce hay for export? Uh, probably not alfalfa. The West certainly has the edge. But we can produce timothy and mixed grass hay. We can produce oat hay. Um, and maybe there's some other options. Uh, rye grass is also an ex has excellent forage quality to it. So that's something else we could think about. And do we need to think about some more technology, you know, some conditioning machinery or maybe some inoculants to help us beat the weather? So, um, again, the, the, the uh, transportation part of it. So we have the climate for hay. Um, Western companies might want to spread their risk because out there they have water issues. And I did talk to a couple of them. They haven't spread their risk by coming out east, but they have considered it. And then we do have a rail system here in New York that goes throughout the state. Uh, different companies own the, the different rail lines. So I live here in Washington County and up in Salem, there's a feed plant and you think they would get their corn by rail from Albany, but actually they don't. They have to get it from East Springfield, Massachusetts. So we have a rail system, but it's a little bit tricky. In the port of Albany, we take in calcium chloride from Europe. And, you know, just in the back of my mind, I'm thinking, why don't we do a backhaul of hay? Maybe some hay cubes and some totes, something they can manage with their ships. And plus, we have two other ports in New York. So the challenges. Uh, unfortunately, I don't think many U New York farmers take hay very seriously. At the New York State Fair, there was only 18 contestants. Uh, I, that was probably 2017 when I looked it up. Uh, we don't really have, we don't have a chapter of the American Forage and Grassland Council here in New York. And I think that's just indicative of our attitude towards forage. Um, the other, I think this here is probably our biggest challenge is that many of our acres are managed by part-time farmers and they're doing it on the side, they're doing it after work. And for them to step up their game, make their business a little bit more intensive, I don't think they've got the energy or the interest to do that. They just kind of want to cruise along. We do have small field sizes and that does reduce a lot of our uh, efficiency. No matter what, even out west and in the east, profit margins are quite tight. Weather will always be a challenge. Um, 
to have consistent quality, but uh, that's something we can, we can work with a little bit. And again, we just need, for export, we either need an entrepreneur that really knows how to make things happen, or we need to maybe subcontract with someone that's already in the export business to, to move eastern hay across the ocean. So those are just some of my thoughts on it. Um, again, I think there's long term, I think uh, exporting hay, the, the markets are going to be there. So that's not a lot of data, but a lot of thought. So as I drive around my counties, I see this idle land and I, I the hardest part, like Mike said, was getting people to get the entrepreneurial spirit and thought in their head to really make things happen. So, any questions for any of us? Cool. Yes, I have a question when you're thinking about especially the marginal land. You know, as you said, a lot of land in New York is hilly, rocky, and clay. Um, we're modeling the profitability return on sort of investment. Uh, do you consider it a temporal model in? When you're looking at putting land to production, because if you, is there any risk of uh, driving the soil to really low productivity? If you're starting off with land that is already. So, is there a risk of degrading the soils, basically? Well, you know, when we want to build our soils, we usually put them into forage. So, I think, you know, forage is a great way to build soils and maintain. Uh, maintain and build soil quality and prevent erosion. So uh, I don't, I guess, you know, if you have shrubs, like in my, my little eight acre field, I had to pull up, you know, four inch pine trees and honeysuckle bushes. And so, you know, there's a little bit of disturbance there, but it's a short term disturbance. But I think that would be the only risk there, really. Yeah, I would just chime in and say again, kind of marginal depends what you're doing with it. So I think most of these lands, are, many of these lands are not at all suitable for annual production on an ongoing basis. Um, but most of them are, you know, biophysically suitable for perennial production. Yeah. Yes. What strikes me, the biggest problem, you mentioned the variable weather in, you know, when you're going to harvest the hay and the quality and the, it's so variable in New York State. And in the West, they can guarantee a quality for better, when you, well, you irrigate, it's hot, you're in the Central Valley, you guarantee a quality to your buyer. Um, here, that's, you know, quite difficult for an export market. As I it is, it is. I, I think the West has an advantage, but I think, I think if we really wanted to, we could do it. Yeah. If we added maybe a little bit more machinery, maybe some inoculants. Well, this is why I was thinking more back to what Peter said, you know, back to the something like the pellets or something that maybe is not as economic, that, that's much less dependent on, you know, you, you having good quality forage. It's more biomass and pellets. Not that I'm in favor of it, I'm just trying to point out it right. seems, this seems like a really difficult thing for someone to invest, even if the Westerners come here. They want to diversify, but then they say, yeah, but it's really hard to make projections because the weather is so variable here. Well, so agreed. Uh, and I think you're right. We wouldn't be doing alfalfa, but if you have Kentucky bluegrass and ladino clover and it rains all week, I'm just going to leave it there. Yeah. The only thing that changes is some leaves die and some new leaves okay. grow. So the quality doesn't it's not like if it was alfalfa for a whole week, you'd be gaining at like a percentage point of NDF a day, okay, right. or a couple days. Yeah. So I think if we if we think outside the box a little bit, we're not going to maybe be as competitive as the West, but I think we've got to. We, I think we can play with them. Thanks. You know, there was another question. Yeah. Um, I'll try to formulate this into a question. Just like looking at the three conversations here, we have about somewhere north of $3 billion worth of assets sitting out there not being used. Bigger, you know, a million plus, million and a half acres. You have this industry which is 
potentially profitable in this beef industry or grazing industry, but it's just kind of not happening. And you know, it hasn't quite reached a critical mass or an industrial cluster or whatever, wherever it has to be. And here we have all this hay production, and we're thinking about exporting it when we have this enormous market that's eating beef. Probably New York City is eating like a million beef animals a year. Uh, so it's you know it seems like hard to quite put this together and explain it. Um, and uh, maybe it's just an economic development question. Maybe this land really isn't profitable. Maybe it's just like Bitcoin. It's just something you put money in. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's not virtual. It's <laughs> uh, but it's a store of value. Maybe. Uh, I mean, that's not my sense. My sense is you can run profitable grazing operations um, and get the land more productive by moving it in perennial pasture. But I guess the question then is, why is this the situation? I mean, what what, what is the solution? Is is this a is this, is this a economic development job for for our government or for who does this? I can I can give you my non cooperative extension Aaron Gabriel point of view. Yeah. Um, I know we keep talking about feeding the population in 2050. Yeah. But honestly, we have way too much food around. You know, there's the the real the real source of this issue is markets you know if there was a profitable beef market consistently profitable beef beef market or a consistently profitable hay market there wouldn't be any idle land in new york or anywhere okay so honestly we have an an overproduction in our system and there's plenty of food I know in some parts of the world it's not, but it's not a matter of supply, it's a matter of you know, civil war and all the other sociological things that are going on. So, so I mean, on, I don't want to be de depressing, you know, but we have a lot of food and there's, it's hard to market. So my neighbor has sold their dairy animals. Right. I just visited a farmer yesterday who's going to be selling his animals in a couple months. Uh, our whole, our whole f production system is uh, is a challenge, you know. But it costs a lot less to graze an animal for one day in New York than it does in the places that we think of as beef country. A lot less, and the market is a lot closer. The rest of the components of the system are not here. You know, the low cost processing, the the finishing, the the human capital around the beef world, even though we have a lot of dairy people, it's really kind of two different species, actually. You know, right. dairy versus beef. So, I don't know. Well, I, I agree with you because yeah. I just bought grass-fed beef. That are getting drier, and we're staying wet. Right. Right. I just bought grass-fed hamburger in the store from Australia, yeah. and there actually is a group, a guy. He spoke at our winter greenup meeting, and I'm forgetting his name and the name of his business, but he's trying to get farmers, he's trying to get two types of farmers, cow-calf operations and finishers to do grass-fed beef here in the Northeast. And you're doing this. You know, and um, so I hope that works, but it's getting farmers to work together. It's getting that entrepreneur that, like this person and yourself, that's got the vision to actually make it work. So, yes. How is it for dairy farmers that are going into the state to transition to beef operations? I mean, it seems like maybe they would be well suited, but I don't know. It's, um, you, I think you can do it. Uh, it. It's a totally different financial structure, though, I would say. You know, they're going from you know, high value, milk is pretty high value compared to beef, you know, and, you know, 70 bucks a head profit. So if you want to make a living, you would need a thousand cattle. Right. So the, you know, my neighbors, I think he had a herd of about 150 dairy cows. He's got 300 acres, you know to go to a thousand head of beef animals. And then if every dairy farmer did that, you know, what happens to the markets? So, I mean, 
I don't want to be depressing, but it's really a frustrating. I've been with Extension for 23 years, and I started to, uh, I went into it to help farmers, and 23 years later, it's the very same issue. And I, I was like, what have I been doing all this time? So. Maggie. <laughs> <laughs> I know. <laughs> so I anyway. think we're, we're about out of time, so why don't we thank your... This has been a production of Cornell University, on the web at cornell.edu.